you have your Bibles, uh, open them to Luke chapter number 18. We've begin, been in a series uh, this year, the past six weeks, we've been talking about seeking to grow closer to the Lord, seeking to uh, have our quiet time, our daily time of looking into His Word. And what you've found is the Word of God's become, uh, you've always loved it, but hasn't it become a little bit more fresh since we've been more uh, sensitive to look at it? We've taken the initiative to look at the Word of God, to pray. We've been talking about those things in prayer. Uh, we, we have, um, there's always a freshness that comes with our spirit. Um, we've probably said no to temptation a few more times than we have before in the past. There's a little bit new vigor about all the walk that we've done. Now, this is my third message, uh, not my last message on prayer, but uh, the last one in this series on prayer. And I've timed it kind of um, importantly because it's been six weeks since we've been uh, seeking to draw closer to the Lord. We've, been, we, we've said we're going to read God's Word every day. We're going to seek to draw closer in our hearts. And we've been praying. How many of you have your prayer cards? Got your prayer cards with that little uh, uh, something written down on it. By the way, if you don't have them, uh, let me know and I'll get you some uh, cards. You can write your prayer requests down on them and keep them with you all the time. That's a good thing. It's a good reminder. I have one this week, and I was just, I pulled the next one as it came up, and for that one little card, I prayed over an hour over that one specific thing. It was the right need at the right moment in my spirit, and I just joined the Lord there. Just a prompter. That's all we're looking for. Like the uh, acronyms, you know, like pray, P. Praise the Lord. R, repent. A, you know, ask. Ask of the Lord what, what's on your heart. Y, yield unto the Lord. And then we, we talk about the acronym ACTS, like A-C-T-S. Give him adoration. Bring confession. Confess what's right on your heart at that moment. Then bring thanksgiving. Whatever you're feeling in thanksgiving for God right then and there. And then bring supplication unto the Lord. These are normal things that we should be able to do all the time. We should pray scripture. We should uh, actually in, insert our name in the scripture and make it real to us. These are things that we should do. And I know that God's been blessing. And I know that your life is good. And maybe he's moved some obstacles out of the way. But um, the only way you can fail, the only way you can fail is if you fail to pray. And I put a quote in here from a, one of my favorite preachers. I quote him all the time, Dr. Adrian Rogers. He said this, everything we truly believe, we obey. Everything else is just really religious talk. Everything we truly believe, we practice in our life and we obey. All the rest is just religious talk. I don't know about you, but I don't want to have much of that religious talk in my life. Amen. I want it to be real. My heart and God's heart, one together, melted by his love. If you have your Bibles, Luke chapter 18. We're going to begin in verse number one. And if you would, would you stand with me in honor of reading God's word? You pray for me as I preach. Is that fair? I'll pray for you as you, as you listen. You pray for me as I preach. He spoke a parable to them. Why? He gives us the reason right now. That men always ought to pray and not lose heart. Not grow faint. Not grow weary. Not grow tired. Not get off track. Not to lose the vigor and the passion of your soul. He gives us a parable. Verse 2. There was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God nor regard man. And there was a widow in that city, and she came to him saying, Get justice for me from my adversary. And he would not for a while. But afterwards he said within himself, Though I do not fear God nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming, she weary me. Then the Lord said, 
Hear what the unjust judge said. And shall God not avenge his own elect, his own children, his own ones that he loves so very much? He says, shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, I thank you for this moment in time. I thank you for those that have come to uh, see the Word of God, hear the Word of God, listen to you, Holy Spirit of God. And Lord, we open it up that you would do in these next few moments that's which will bring glory unto you and blessing upon us. Father, your will and your will alone be done. In your name I pray, amen. Y'all can be seated. Jesus lets us know right off the bat that this is a parable of contrast, not comparison. He brings the difference between himself and this unjust judge. This judge, it says, he doesn't have any regard for God. And he really doesn't care what anybody else thinks either. Have you ever known anybody like that? They're just going to do what they want. They don't care about anybody else. Or they really don't have a moral compass that pushes them to do the right thing. And we see this person, and there's a widow who comes. Something has happened to her. And she's going to the judge that the judge, and I like this word, will avenge her. Will give her justice. Will straighten things out for her doesn't tell us what it is, and we really don't need to know. And she comes to the judge and she asks, and he just says, I don't think so. You see, this woman, she was a widow. Number one, she was a woman, and a woman had no standing. She, she was not allowed to come to court and plead her own case. She was a woman. She had no standing because of that, but she had no standing also because she was a widow. She had no husband to go with her to plead her case for her. And beyond that, she was poor. She was the overlooked part of society. But what we find out is that this woman came and pleaded her case anyway. She didn't care if it was the right thing. She just said, avenge me, give me justice. And when he didn't give her justice, she came again. And she came again. And she came again. Are you starting to see a pattern here? And she came again. And she wasn't rude. And she wasn't mean. You know how some people are that, that, that they'll try to get their way, and if things don't go their way, then they'll crank up another gear, and they might get mad, and they might get angry, and they're going to they're gonna get their way. By the way, nobody has the right to be rude, Right? I don't care who you are, if you're going down the road and you get pulled over by that police officer and you were only going 14 miles over the speed limit, right? I mean, you weren't going 15 or 16 miles. You're not a super speeder. I mean, and that, uh, why is he out here anyway? He ought to be out solving crimes with kale, right? He ought to be out. Why is he out here trying to give me a ticket? And you just want to give him a piece of your mind. I, I give you a good word. Don't do it. Amen. You might find yourself a super speeder after all. Nobody has a right to be rude. You don't have a right to be rude. They don't have a right to be rude. Nobody has a right. I don't care if you don't get your way. It tells us in this, nowhere does it say that this woman took things in her own hands except for the fact that she just kept coming back. Can you see that judge walking into court? All rise. Everybody stands. You can be seated. He looks down and he sees the docket in front of him. He looks up and he says, Goodness. She's here again. I've already heard her case once. I've heard, I've already told that woman no enough. Is she not going to get it? But hear what the parable says. He says here, and he would not for a while, but afterwards he said within himself, though I do not fear God, I'm not worried about what God's going to do to me. Nor regard man, I don't care what anybody else says about it. He says, though I do not fear God nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, because she comes and she comes and she comes and she comes, 
I will avenge her. I'll give her the justice that she wants. Lest, by her continual coming, she weary me. Now hear this. Jesus is saying, this unjust judge, it's a parable of contrast. He doesn't love God. He's not doing the right thing. Nobody's forcing him to do it. But because she comes and comes and comes and comes, he says, I'll give her what she wants just so that I can get rid of her. But I'm a loving God. Will I not take care of the ones I love so very much? Will I not take care of them and hear them? And when their heart breaks, my heart breaks. And when something, listen to me now, when something wrong goes against them, it's a wrong against me as well. Aren't you glad that you have a God that's on your side? Aren't you glad that you have a God who cares? You see, this parable is very important for us after we've been doing what we've been doing for six weeks, seeking to draw closer to the Lord. Because if you're not careful, Satan will do everything that he can to keep you from praying. By the way, he's not afraid of you, but he's afraid of your prayers. He's not afraid of you having a fit or you doing anything, but he's afraid of what God can do. And if you stir up the most powerful one, if you stir up the one who is in control, you stir up the one who's high and lifted up upon the throne of mercy and grace, then the things of earth will change through the prayers of a little old widow. No standing in the community. No standing before the judge. No one to go on the case before her. Yet, listen to me now, she would not be denied. God says, don't you think I love my children enough that they don't have, if the unjust judge would do it, won't I do it? Don't I care? Am I not willing? Look at here, he says, Shall God not avenge his own elect to cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? Now this key next phrase, I, I don't know that you're going to believe it, but I'm going to preach it anyway. Y'all good with that? He says in verse 18, I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Does God answer your prayers speedily? When your heart's crying out and you're looking for something to happen, do you actually see it speedily? I studied that this week. I mean, I want to rightly divide the word of truth. I wanted to know exactly what it said. And I studied it, and I talked to other people, and I, I read some other what some other pastors had said about it. And you know what the word speedily really means? Are y'all ready for this? You know what the word speedily really means? Speedily. Quick. When you pray, and you're asking, and God hears, God wants to answer quickly. Can I get an amen? amen? But let's look at the phrase before that. We're going to put it in context. Look what the phrase before that says. He says, though he bears long with them. Well, what does that mean? The word bears means that he has to endure. God's been trying to do a work in our life. We're praying, but prayer is communication. It's a relationship. It's you and God. So you come, and you bear your heart, and God listens. Listen to me now. And God comes and bears his heart, and you listen. And when you come, you're, you're bringing your petition hoping that God will hear your petition. He will empower your petition and that you'll get the answer that you're looking for. But when God comes in prayer with you, whispers with you, He is looking for you to hear. And He's looking for you to bear the petition. He's looking for you to obey the petition. He's looking for you to do what He wants done as well. If you're looking at prayer being one-sided, 
God's not a one-sided God. God loves you. Amen? God hears you. Amen? He sees your heart. He sees your circumstance. And that's really what we need to do is come bear our heart before him. But let me uh, share a few things that we need to be reminded of. In Mark chapter number 11, in verse 25, Jesus said this, And whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, it really doesn't matter what it is. If you've got a problem with someone, by the way, they may have done something to you. They may be wrong. It may be all their fault. But if you are the victim, maybe, of unforgiveness, you have not forgiven them, you have not released them from the debt. And by the way, people come to me and say, uh, you know, I, I've forgiven them, but, and I want to say, stop right there, right? Get your butts out of here. Get all, the, get all the things that are keeping you from all those things. Just come, and let's just say, either you forgive or you don't. I, I want to tell you, I was in ministry already preaching when God came to me and revealed to me that I had an unforgiving spirit. And I really did not know and realize that there was ramifications that were happening in my life because I had not. I was willing to go to the throne of grace and receive forgiveness. I wasn't willing to go to the throne of grace and give forgiveness. And Jesus simply says, if you're standing praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive him that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. But if you do not forgive, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. When we come and we confess our sins, Jesus re removes our sins as far as the east is from the west. That's a long way. And to that we say amen, right? But hold on. What about the person who's harmed you? Do you want that person's sin to be removed as far as the east is from the west? Do you want them to have mercy as well? Are you waiting for them to do something before you'll forgive them? Do you think they deserve it? People say, oh, that's easy preaching, hard living. From someone who found out in my own life when I was preaching to others but I had a spirit of bitterness and wrath and unforgiveness in my own heart. I have found, I have found that the easiest thing to do is let go and let God. They no longer are under my control. I give them over to Jesus. I pray for them now. I pray blessings for them now. Someone asked me between service and said, can you, can you, is it okay to forgive if you don't forget? I said, if you do forgive, you will forget. There are things that absolutely controlled me, but when I found the forgiveness of God, hey, if that person came up to me now, I could absolutely smile. I could put blessings upon them. I could just absolutely be okay with it because guess what? God has done a miracle of his grace in me. There are some barriers that we do because we come to him looking for answers and blessings, but we're handcuffing him. He says, though I bear with you long, hard, longly, hard, hard, yet I will answer you speedily. Then he says, but when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? Are we really going to find people who are going to love God, trust God, and do it God's way? Release, get all this other junk out of the way. If we have a daily quiet time, God will tell us what we need in his word. If we have a time of daily prayer, he'll give us the words that we need. We can pray to him, but he'll also speak to us. And we can clear the slate. We can get freed up. And the Holy Spirit can begin to bubble up and work. And the good times will roll. 
The joy of the Lord will come. You'll know what it means to have the joy of your salvation. What a blessing. What a blessing it is. Well, let's look over Matthew. Let's look. I hate to get into one of Jesus' sermons, but why don't we do it in Matthew in chapter 6? I could take you to Matthew 5, but let's, for, for time, let's just look at Matthew 6, that Sermon on the Mount. In verse number 5. Are you there? If you're not, just listen. Matthew chapter 6, verse 5. And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites. Now that's those people who, who really, you know, are seeking God, not just seeking to put on a false front. He said, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the street that they may be seen by men trying to act religious. He said, I say to you, they have their reward. But you, when you pray, go into your room. Old King James says, go into your closet. I, I actually have a preacher friend who uh, will go to his bedroom, go in the closet, get underneath the clothes, push the shoes out, and he'll get in there and close the door and just dark with him in his stinky shoes. I think he's taking that literal. But in the day in which they lived, sometimes you would have three generations living in one house. And by the way, it wasn't a big house. So he was saying, if you're going to have some time to get along with God, get along with God. Go into your room. Go into your closet if you have to. But this is not for public. There's other people who want to be heard public. because, And, and, and you know the, the people who when they pray, they're not praying for God's ears. They're praying for everybody else's ears. Have y'all ever heard anybody pray and they pray in the old King James? They get at the, they get at the these and the thous. I, I, I know somebody who, who, who you, you just talk to them and they'll say God, but when they pray they say God. That's vain repetition. That, hey, God's not interested in that. You know, I think it's okay just to talk to him. I tell jokes to him. I don't know if he laughs or not. I may burden his soul. I don't know, but I just want to be Brian. I want to come and, and just share it with him. It's not for public. It's, so not, it's not so that you'll be seen by others and thought well of others, but it's just coming to the Lord. He says here, go into your room. When you shut your door, pray to the Father who is in the secret place, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you up openly and when you pray do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do no for they think that they will be heard by their many words I'm not against praying for an hour but I'm not saying you have to pray for an hour first Thessalonians 5 17 says pray without ceasing Galatians 5 25 says as you walk in the spirit you shall also walk in the flesh Right? We're supposed to take the Spirit of God and carry it out and walk it out every day. So as I'm praying, I'm supposed to be always in an attitude of prayer. And as I'm walking in the flesh and I'm leaning upon the Holy Spirit, I should always walk in the Holy Spirit. I should always be looking for Him to do great and mighty things. He says, therefore, do not be like them, for your Father knows the things that you need before you ask them. By the way, let me go on down to verse 14. If you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not, if you do not, if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Have you really turned them loose? Have you really turned them Loose. If we live in the Spirit, not walk in the flesh, walk in the Spirit. We walk in the flesh, but let us walk in the Spirit of God. In the first century, before first century BC, before Christ was born on the earth, the Romans had come in and taken over the land in Palestine. And there was a time that there was a drought in the land. 
no rain. The springs dried up. The Romans took whatever water there was there and kept it all for themselves. So the people of Israel just did without. There was a, an old prophet who lived just outside Jerusalem's walls. His name was Hani, H-O-N-I. I get this story from Mark Batterson, who gets it from the stories of the historian Josephus. Mark Batterson wrote a book called The Circuit Maker. Circle maker. He said that Hani, in the midst of this huge drought, and people knew that he was a man of God, he took his staff and walked out where everybody could see him, and he put his staff in the ground, and he began to draw a circle. And he took his staff, that six-foot staff, and he went all the way around with everybody watching him. And I love this because this was something that many historians have written about, all of them give the same quote. Here's the words that he said. He drew the circle with his staff, fell on his knees in the circle, lifted his hands up to heaven. Here is the words that he shared. Lord of the universe, I swear before your great name that I will not leave this circle until you have mercy upon your children. And after he prayed this prayer, raindrops began to fall. But then he said this. He's still looking down. People are cheering, congratulating. But he prays this. Not for such rain have I prayed, but for rain that will fill cisterns and pits and caverns. The historians tell us that at that point in time, it began to be a huge flood of water. Josephus says that he was, that the story goes that water the size of a small leg began to fall down. People literally began to run for the high ground or to the temple mount because of the, the water of the runoff from the temple area in Jerusalem. And then, with the downpour coming and his circle being faded away around him, Hani prayed this prayer. Not for such rain have I prayed, but rain of your favor, blessings, and graciousness. And at that point in time, we are told that the rain turned into a a light rain. Anybody, anybody ever been to Florida and down there where you, you look up in the sky and you see a cloud about the size of a hand? 15 minutes later, there's a downpour coming. And then 15 minutes later, it might just be a mist. But Lord, for your favor upon your people, I will not leave this circle until. And the rain came and filled the cisterns and the pits and the caverns. And the fields turned green. And the crops began to grow again. And all these 21 centuries later, an old preacher and Gainesville, Georgia is telling the story again. One of the stories I love so very much is one of my favorite writers. His name is Bob Goff, and he wrote a book called Love Does. And I cannot tell you how many times I've read that book. I love the book. And, and Bob was an attorney. Matter of fact, he's one of, uh, he's a very famous attorney today. He lives in California today. But when he graduated, he got his undergraduate, graduated from college, he wanted to go to law school. You have, to get into law school, you have to take a test called the LSAT, the Legal Scholastic Aptitude Test. And, the, and if you don't get a, it's 175 questions, they're all multiple choice, but if you don't pass the LSAT or if you don't get the certain grade on it, you can't get into law school. And some law schools, uh, the, the grading system is different. And he wanted to go to Pepperdine uh, University in California. 
but his LSAT wasn't high enough. So he went to the dean. I mean, he went straight to the dean. And he got an appointment. He went in and he said, uh, Dean, I really want to go to this school. The dean checked on it and said, well, the class is full. You know, you're more than willing to apply again. Work on your LSAT, right? Maybe, maybe the, no, I want to go this semester. Dean, you can let me in if you want to. The dean gave him, can you just imagine the smile on the dean's face? Okay, it's all right. Classes are full. But you can let me in. All you got to say is go buy, my, buy your books and I'm in. Well, we thank you for wanting to come to Pepperdine. God bless you. Kind of that thing. Dismissed. So Bob Goff decided to do this. He got a chair and pulled it right outside the dean's office and sat in that chair. The dean gets out and goes to lunch. He looks over and says, what are you doing here? I want to go to law school here. I mean, would you... Okay, all right. And every time he went out of his office to go down to use the restroom at the end of the hallway or to get some water or something like that, Bob Goff was just sitting there. He sat there all day long. Dean gets at the end of the day, looks at him, goes home. Dean comes back the next day, looks at him, and Bob Goff sitting in the chair right there. Hey, Bob. Hey, Dean. Dean, can I get in? He did that all the second day and the third day. It got to the place where the dean was doing everything he can just to avoid Bob sitting there in his chair outside of his door. The fourth day until finally the last day he looks at him. You really want to be at school here, don't you? Yes, sir. Looked at him and just said those words, go get your books. And we have a God in heaven who never misses a prayer. Whether it's whispered, whether we're walking, whether we're driving, whether we're, our eyes are closed or our eyes are open, whether, whether we're on our knees, whether we're bent over like a question mark, whether our hands are lifted up or they're not, whether tears are flowing down our face or just a solemn word of belief and trust, God hears everyone. In church, I really believe this with all my heart. When Jesus put in those words, will he not answer speedily? I think that shares his heart. He's really looking to see how true we really are. Maybe Adrian Rogers' words are right. Everything that we truly believe, we obey. Everything else is just religious talk. I love Matthew 7, verse 7. Ask, and you shall receive. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door shall be open. But you know what that verse really says? If you look at the grammar in it, it says ask, and keep on asking, and keep on asking, and keep on asking. Seek and keep on seeking and keep on seeking and keep on seeking and knock and keep on knocking and keep on knocking and keep on knocking. But you know what God revealed to my spirit this week? It builds. You ask and keep on asking and keep on asking. When that's not enough, you get up and you start seeking and you start seeking and you start seeking until you find. And when you find the door, knock. And keep on knocking. And keep on knocking. And then banging on that door until finally the God of love who can, the God who can answers the door. And you can come in. And you will receive. You will be found. The door will be opened. But will he find such faith on the earth? When Elijah said, it will not rain, it didn't rain for three and a half years. Don't think that was just one prayer. Don't you think he prayed it all week? Don't you think he prayed it every week? Lord, keep the rain, withhold the rain. 
Lord, it's not time, withhold the rain. As he walked, and he was, he was enemy number one on King Ahab's list. They searched the country over trying to find him. But at the right time, Ahab comes back. And you know there was a showdown on Mount Carmel. And he put the offering there. And he prayed a simple prayer. And the fire from heaven fell. And everyone knew that, that there was one God to receive honor and glory. But then it was time for him to do something else. And he went and he fell on his face. And he began to pray for rain. And he asked his servant, go look and see if you see rain. And he came back, no rain. And he prayed again, go look. And there was no rain. And he prayed, go look. And he came back, no rain. Until the seventh time. Come on now, seven's the number of completion. Y'all with me? Until the seventh time. His servant came back and said, I, I saw a cloud the size of a man's hand. And before you knew it, a thunder boomer was coming. And rain came back to Israel. Let it rain. It is said of Elijah that the effectual fervent prayers of a righteous man availeth much. Let it rain. Are we willing to pray and pray through and not stop and not slow down, but let God grow it? Come on now, let him grow it. May we pray, but may we listen. May we let the Lord begin to cleanse our hearts. He's faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. Psalm says we come with, Psalms 24, with clean hands and a pure heart. Are you ready to pray? Don't stop believing. Keep praying. Heads bowed. Father God, we love you. We thank you for the opportunity, O oh Lord. We thank you are our kind of a God, and we are grateful. You're the God who finds us in our sin and in our need who comes on our behalf. Jesus, you made a way where there was no way. You, you shed your blood because it was the only one that could cleanse us from all of our sins as far as the east is from your west. And Lord, you were patiently waiting on me, a 10-year-old boy, to come and confess my sins and to give my heart and life and to seek after following you the remainder of my days. And that's where I am right now, Lord, wanting to follow you, give my heart and life unto you want to be a disciple of Christ, want to turn away from everything else but your will. God, I know that you're the God who is greater than all. You're the God who can. Would you do it today? Would you do it again? Lord, will we find some honeys who will draw a circle around themselves and say, I will not leave this circle until you answer Will we not give up? Will we be like this widow that comes and comes? Send us cleansing revival rains again. Oh, that the showers will fall. And Lord, let it begin in me. Let it begin in this church. Let it flood this community. Let it be for your honor and your glory alone. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.